Houston One and Elvis Express Radio. We have uh, Marty Lacker. Hello, Mr. Lacker. How you doing, sir? Hi, Joe. How you doing? I'm pretty good today. Hot here in New York. Uh, same thing here in Memphis. Yeah. Uh, sir, can you tell me a little bit about yourself, uh, where you grew up, and uh, what your parents did? Well, I was uh, born in Brooklyn, but I grew up in the South Bronx in New York and moved to Memphis when I was 15 and uh, went into uh, high school down here, the second year of high school. And the first high school I went to, I didn't particularly like, so I was transferred to Humes High. Mm -hmm. And that's where I met Elvis and Red West. Uh, I went out for football and Red was uh, a uh, well-known uh, football star in Memphis and became a big one in uh, in the South. And uh, wasn't really close to Elvis in school. We knew of each other because of the way we dressed, really. Uh, Elvis dressed very unusual for Memphis. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the guys down here back then wore jeans and T-shirts and had crew cuts. And Elvis wore these loud clothes, uh, wore his collar up, had his hair in the DA, which, uh, for those who don't know what a DA is, it's the back of his hair looks like a duck's ass. That's why it's called DA. Uh -huh. And a pompadour in his hair. And basically, I dressed the same, and the kids at school used to kid us, wondering who was out going to have to outdress who the next day. Mm -hmm. uh, in 1953, uh, we both left Humes. Elvis graduated. I did not quit because uh, although I was a, a, a good student, naturally, uh, I say that naturally without having to study, uh, I just didn't have the patience to sit in the classroom all day, and I wanted to go out and make money. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, that was in uh, 53, and summer of 53. And then as time went by, I had got into a uh, manager's training program of, of one of the big department stores down here, department store chains in the south. When uh, I was dri riding down one of the streets one night with uh, a good friend of mine who also went to use, and we were listening to Dewey Phillips mm -hmm. on the radio. And uh, uh, Dewey uh, said, I'm going to play this record by this new boy. Uh, Dewey was a character unto himself, and the way he talked, uh, I'm not going to try to imitate him. I have uh, this record by this new boy, and he's sensational, and he's different than anything you've ever heard. And this boy is from right here in Memphis at Humes High School. Well, my friend Monty and I both looked at each other. We were wondering who in the world it was. Mm -hmm. And he played... That's all right, Mama. And I thought it was Elvis because he had he had sung at a talent show at school one time. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but I wasn't sure. So with the end end of the record, Dewey said uh, uh, that was Elvis Presley from Hughes High School, uh, right here in Memphis, and I'm gonna play it again because he had gotten so many calls that night. Mm -hmm. He kept playing that record over and over again. And shopping, a shopping center, uh, the first shopping center that opened in Memphis, Poplar Plaza Shopping Center, uh, I was transferred to the new department store that had just opened with the center. And they were having a grand opening for a Katz drugstore. Uh, that was a, a chain store that had never been in Memphis before. Mm -hmm. And as the entertainment was, they hired Elvis and Scotty Moore and Bill Black. Wow. That was in 1954. And uh, they had him on a stake, on a, on a big uh, bed of a truck in the back parking lot. So at my break, I went out to see him, to mm -hmm. listen to him, and he saw me in the audience and he pointed at me. And that, that was really the extent of, of our knowing each other back then. Mm -hmm. uh, a few months later, I went into the Army. And uh, I ended up spending uh, a long time, in, uh, well, 18 months in Germany, 
when I came back out at the end of 56, uh, I, uh, and while I, while, of course, while I was in Germany is when Elvis really got big nationally. Mm -hmm. See, a lot of people don't understand who, who didn't live in the South, but almost immediately from the beginning, Elvis took off in the South mm -hmm. from that first record. And he changed the culture of, of the world including, uh, which was no small thing as in the South, so he knocked down a lot of barriers for mm -hmm. singers. And uh, it always bothers me when I, when I hear uh, a young black artist who probably was never born, was not born before when Elvis started, and probably wasn't even born when he died, make comments like Elvis stealing black music. Right. And uh, uh, that Elvis was a racist. And that's so far from the truth. Elvis mm. felt, Elvis felt everything he sang. Mm -hmm. In the beginning especially, he sang what was inside him. What he, what was he influenced by black artists? Absolutely. By, and, and a lot of people would be surprised as to who, <laughs> as to who really influenced him more. Uh, they always, you know, talk about Little Richard and Chuck Berry and, because actually Chuck Berry came in after Elvis. Mm -hmm. um, but we had a discussion the night before he went uh, started the American recording sessions at American Studios here in Memphis and he said uh, you know a lot of people really don't realize who who really influenced me as far as my singing was concerned because Elvis always liked singers with big voices mm -hmm. and uh, he named off you know a bunch of, of, of artists like Billy Eckstein and Arthur Prysock and Brooke Benton, who he loved his smooth singing, and uh, Jay Kess is a white gospel singer. And not, I mean, he, he admired Little Richard. Uh, he, he got, Elvis's style came from listening to the radio when, when he was a kid in Mississippi. Because they didn't have television back then. And he listened to the blues stations, the black blues stations in Mississippi, and also the country stations. And what Elvis's singing style turned out to be, which he formed from what he felt inside, was a combination of both, but it was his style. Nobody else had ever sung that way before. Mm -hmm. That's why he was such a phenomenon back then, and why, you know, his staying power today is because of I think the way he treated people. Mm -hmm. uh, when he met people, he, you know, he was he was always nice to them, unless somebody wasn't nice to him, and then that would happen every once in a while. And Did he it? Was as good as he got. Did it? Oh, he. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, and uh, when I came out of the army, I messed around for a couple of months, and uh, then one. Uh, Saturday night, uh, shortly after Elvis moved into Graceland, uh, George Klein called me. You know, George I knew from, mm -hmm. from Humes. And he uh, said, would you like to go up and see Elvis tonight? And I said, yeah. You know, it, it was kind of a su surprise call. But I also understood that George didn't know how to drive. <laughs> and he needed a ride. Mm -hmm. And so went up to Graceland and uh, I, I, I've i got sort of a photographic memory. When mm -hmm. I tell stories, I can still see it in my mind. And I remember we uh, drove up the driveway around to the back and that's before what is now known as the jungle room was even there. Mm -hmm. it, it was just a concrete patio, a small one with a little canopy over it. And uh, we parked the car in the back, and we started walking out. We noticed that Elvis and Anita Wood, who was his girlfriend at the time, were walking back from the back pasture, from the barn. And uh, I even remember what he had on. He had on a uh, black and white polka dot shirt. And uh, we stopped at that fence near the office in the back, and. Uh, George said, Elvis, you remember Marty, don't you? He, and he looked at me and he said, yeah. He said, I heard you just got out of the Army. And I looked at him and I said, 
how in the hell do you know that? I said, I know where you've been, but how do you know where I've been? And he said, well, I keep tabs on, on some people, but I, I, you know, I don't know whether that was true or not. Mm-hmm. Uh, because we hadn't seen each other, you know, from that time in the parking lot. And then uh, we stayed up all night. Uh, with, you know, some of the guys were out there. Red was in the Marines at the time. And uh, we shot pool all night and sat and talked. And then before I left, he said, you're welcome to uh, come up here anytime you want to. And I said, I appreciate it. Shortly after that, uh, well, I used to, well, Elvis used to rent a rating, uh, roller skating rink, rainbow roller skating rink out here uh, in East Memphis. And we'd uh, start about midnight. He'd rent the whole, the, the whole rink after it basically closed to the public. And uh, we'd rent it all night long, basically. And uh, it was more like what we called having a war as opposed to just roller skating because we used to choose up sides and knock each other down. <laughs> uh, we, you know, we were young kids and we were just having fun. And also, uh, he would rent the fairgrounds. And he was a night person, so we stayed up all night and slept during the day. Then eventually I went into radio uh, and became a uh, disc jockey and then a program director. And I would see Elvis from time to time uh, because uh, I basically, in the beginning, worked out of town. I worked in a, started off in a little town in Upper uh, West Tennessee, Union City. But on the weekends, I'd come home when Elvis was in town. And uh, I'd mess around with him and the guys. Then uh, I went to Knoxville, which was on the other side of the state. And I'd come home every once in a while when he was home and do the same thing, hang around. And finally I got tired of Knoxville and decided to come back to Memphis. And uh, I had uh, been hired by a radio station, which is no longer in existence, WHHM, in Memphis. And uh, Elvis went into the Army. Uh, I saw him. After his basic training, he came home, he did a session in Nashville, and then uh, when he came home from the session, uh, we listened to the to the dubs from uh, that, that session. And uh, then he had to go back to uh, Fort Hood and then go on to Germany. I didn't see him until he came back home in 1960, of course, because I didn't go to Germany. Lamar and Red went. Mm-hmm. And uh, then when he came home, we just resumed our friendship. And one night in 61, I was still in radio, and uh, he was going the next day to go do Kid Galahad. And we were shooting pool. By that time, I had a wife and a child, a daughter. And uh, I was about to take a, a shot at, at the pool ball, and Elvis said, hold up, hold up a minute. I want to ask you something. I said, what? He said, why don't you come go with us tomorrow? I said, Elvis, you go into Hollywood. <laughs> you know, it's not like going around the corner. Mm-hmm. I said, you go into Hollywood. I said, uh, he said, he said, hell, I know where I'm going. Like that. He said, why don't you come, come out here with us and come work for me? And I said, because I had a wife and a child, I said, Elvis, I had to think about it. Well, that's something you really didn't say to Elvis because, number one, he at that point in his life, he couldn't understand something like that. He couldn't understand why some young young guy would have to think about going to Hollywood mm-hmm. with, with him. And uh, so he went in the other room. It was in the basement then at Chrysler. And when, when I said that, and Elvis walked out of the room. He, he was a little pissed. And Lamar, in his inevitable way, said, oh, you said the wrong thing. So I walked in the next room, and Elvis was sitting 
this is a, it's a bit comical, but this was Elvis. He was sitting in the chair up against the wall, and he had a newspaper in front of him, but he had the newspaper straight up in front of his face, like his face was no more than two inches away from the paper. And I said, Elvis, you got to understand, i got a wife and a child, and I can't just pick up and leave without talking to her, you know, mm -hmm. making her understand. So <laughs> what he did, it took him about a second to understand, and he just lowered the paper straight towards his body. Instead of putting the paper down, he lowered it up to his chin, which, where all I could see was his face. And he said, well, don't think of, uh, don't think about it too damn long because we're leaving, and if you want to go, be here with your bags at 2 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. And then he put the paper straight up in front of his face. <laughs> and uh, that night I went home, or I should say that early morning, and talked to my wife, and naturally she wasn't too happy. But she understood, and uh, we were living with my parents at the time, so she wouldn't be alone. And... Uh, I went out to Hollywood, Kid Galahad, with Elvis, and uh, didn't leave for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> didn't leave for a long time. Uh, in 64, he and uh, Esposito had a uh, falling out on the way back from Hollywood to Memphis in uh, Amarillo, Texas. Because uh, Joe, unfortunately, had a habit of telling Colonel Parker everything Elvis did, which mm -hmm. he didn't like. And uh, what had happened was is that we were in the, in the Holiday Inn, and we were getting ready to leave that night. We, we stayed overnight and slept, or during the day and slept. And we got up in the early evening, and we were going to leave to come back, you know, the rest of the way to Memphis. And when we got outside, there was this huge crowd out there and TV cameras and all kinds of stuff. And it really upset Elvis. And uh, he went, he, we got back up in his room. It was Joe and Elvis and myself. And Elvis started yelling at Joe. Now, at, at that time, I didn't know that Joe had called Colonel Parker, see, while we were at the motel. And uh, I said, no, Elvis, I said, they probably just got out from there. He said, no, you be quiet. <laughs> I said, okay. Well, we come to find out that Joe had called Colonel Parker and told him where we were, and Parker called the TV stations mm -hmm. so that there would be publicity there. And Elvis was just not in the mood that day to uh, fool with him. He just wanted to come home. And... So they didn't speak to each other all the way home on the bus. And we got back to Memphis, and uh, Elvis stayed upstairs, which he usually did too, for about two or three or four days after he came home from Hollywood, to, you know, just to rest up and everything. And Joe and I were out in the garage apartment on the fourth day, and Joe said, told me, he said, he won't talk to me. Uh, I call upstairs and he hangs up. He don't want to talk. He said, if he don't come down and talk to me today, I'm going back to California. I try to talk him out of it. And he said, no, that's what I'm going to do. So he said, As a matter of fact, I'm going to call up there now. And uh, he called upstairs and he said to Elvis, he said, look, are we going to talk? Because if we're not, I'm going I'm going back to California. I'm going back home. And he said, okay, that's the way you want it. And he hung up. <laughs> and Joe handed me the checkbook and the couple of credit cards he had were basically gas credit cards because we didn't have credit cards back then. Uh, and uh, he had told me there was, a, there was a bunch of checks made out uh, in the book that Elvis needed to sign whenever he came down. And Joe left. Uh, uh, he got a, uh, a cab and, and, and left. And just as he hit the gate, or going through the gate, 
I'm sitting in the garage apartment and the intercom buzzes and I pick it up and I said, yeah, and it was Elvis. And he said, is he gone? <laughs> I said, yeah. He said, good, tell the maids I'm coming down to eat my breakfast. I like that. Because mm-hmm. you didn't fool with Elvis like that, you know. And uh, evidently he wanted Joe gone at the time some reason it really bothered him so I said okay and I, I took the checkbook and everything and went into the kitchen told the maids and then a couple of guys started coming in and uh, Elvis sat in the kitchen at the counter and ate his breakfast and we knew well enough that you just didn't talk to, about business or a whole lot of heavy stuff before he had his breakfast he just didn't, he didn't like it, you know. He wanted to wake up. So I waited till he finished, and uh, we were talking for a while, all the guys and myself and him, and Joe wasn't even mentioned. And I said, uh, by the way, Elvis, I said, Joe, give me the checkbook to give to you uh, and let you know that you need to sign the checks in there uh, because there are bills that have to be paid, from basically expenses on the road. And Elvis looked at me and he said, looks like I got a new foreman. And I took it that he was meaning that I was trying to force myself on her. Mm-hmm. I, said, I said, no, Elvis. I said, Joe just gave me the book, you know, to give to you. He said, looks like I got a new foreman. I said, Elvis, he said, looks like I got a new foreman and you got a raise, too. <laughs> I said, well, since you put it that way. <laughs> And, uh, and, you know, jokingly, and he started laughing. Uh, and uh, because we really didn't make much money. You know, the unfortunate part about it is a lot of fans who, who for some reason, don't like some of us, mm-hmm. uh, even though they've never met us, they have no idea really what the relationship was, was like. And uh, they always, a lot of them always bring up, well, you took money from Elvis, you took this, you took that. When I first went to work for him, and I had a wife and a child, I was paid $45 a week. Wow. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, is that there, there, there's some of, a couple, two or three were there for what they could get. But most of us, especially the original guys, we weren't there for the money. There, there really was no money. Yeah, did we have a good time? Yeah, we had a great time. But there were also times when he was not very pleasant to be around. Mm-hmm. But we but we stayed around because of the fact that friends don't, I mean, that's what friends are for. You know, a lot of times he used us to vent his anger, even though he wasn't mad at us. He could have been mad at something else. But we cared enough about him to to listen to it, to take it. And just blow it off because we knew more than likely 30 minutes later it would be over. You know, and mm-hmm. be back to his old crazy self. Uh, so from then on, I was a foreman until and 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 I and I would call Joe every once in a while when we, you know, uh, that year to see how he was doing, and he wasn't doing too well because what he was doing was basically relying on uh, on working in movies as an extra or a bit player. Mm-hmm. And uh, so one time when we went back out to L.A. in 64 and I would talk to Joe and uh, talk to Joe and his wife Joni and uh, I said to him, why don't you come on up to the house tonight? We were, we were, we were at Perugia Way at the time. And he said, well, do you think you He'd want me up there. I said, I don't know. See, I had no problem. I, I, I never... I'm not the type of person who worries about who's closest to who. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I knew that, that we were all equal, all the original guys. And this doesn't apply to the guys that came in later. But all the original guys were, were equally equal in Elvis's eyes. You know, nobody, nobody was special. 
unfortunately some people thought there were, and Joe in particular. And Joe and my style, even though Joe and I got along real well and I've always liked Joe, uh, he would tell people what to do and I'd ask them, ask mm -hmm. people what to, to do something because uh, everybody knew what Elvis needed to be done by then. So anyhow, we were sitting, Elvis had just finished breakfast and he was sitting reading the paper in the den at Purgier Way, it was just me and him. And I said, oh, by the way, Elvis, I said, uh, I invited Joe up to the house tonight. And he looked at me and he said, you need to mind your own damn business. And he got up and went in his room. And I had not seen Elvis harbor that feeling towards anybody before, except one person who I'll leave unnamed. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I called Joe and I said, I don't think it's a good idea for you to show up tonight. And, and that's the way that happened. And so after uh, a couple of movies, we went back to Memphis in late, uh, early 65. Uh, we, we went back in late 64, and in early 65, right after New Year's, uh, we had gone to the movie, all night movie, and at that time, my family and I, uh, which by then included a son, so I had two children and my wife, we lived, we lived at Graceland, in the Graceland Garage apartment, and we got, we got back from the movies, and uh, it's about three o'clock in the morning. And the phone rang. Elvis had gone upstairs to go to bed, and it was Joe. And uh, he said, uh, how y'all doing? I said, well, fine. I said, how you doing? He said, well, not too good. He said, uh, I'm tired of sitting here uh, waiting for uh, central casting to call me all the time so I can get some work. And, Essential casting, for those who don't know, in Hollywood are the people who call uh, extras and uh, sometimes what they call bit players, where, you, where, where you're an extra, but you may have a speaking word or an action with mm -hmm. a star. And he said, they're really not calling me a whole lot, and I'm really hurting. He said, do you think Elvis would take me back? And I said, I don't know, Joe. I said, he said, well, where is he? I said, he's upstairs. We just got home. He said, well, will you ask him if he'll talk to me? I said, hold on. So I put him on hold, and I buzzed upstairs, and I said, Elvis, Joe's on the phone, and he said, what does he want? And I said, he wants to know if you'll take him back. And Elvis surprised me, and he asked me, he said, do we need him? We really didn't need him. We were, you know, we had eight guys at the time. But without hesitating, I said, yes. I said, uh, you know, he knows uh, how things are done and what have you. And, you know, he said, well, what line is he on? I said, he's on line one. So he said, okay, I'll talk to him. And he talked to him. And he buzzed me back and he said, uh, pick up the phone, uh, send him a plane ticket, send him a couple of hundred bucks. And if he needs anything at first, when he comes back, uh, let him have it as far as money is concerned. Mm -hmm. I said, okay. So Joe came by, back and, uh, and we sort of split duties, even though it wasn't really official. I was basically the foreman, but like I said, I, I never had a problem, you know, with that. Mm -hmm. So he did some things, and I basically let him handle the colonel. Not handle him, but deal with him, because mm -hmm. I, I didn't like Colonel Parker. No. And Parker didn't like me because I wouldn't tell him nothing. Uh, there's a couple of confrontations we had, and, you know, because uh, when I first became foreman, he said, now, you need to call me every day, and uh, he said this in front of Elvis, he said, you need to call me every day 
and let me know what's going on. I said, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. And he looked at Elvis and he said, isn't that right, Elvis? He said, uh, yeah, Colonel. Uh, Marty, and Elvis looked at me and he said, Marty, you need to call, call the Colonel every day. He said it just like that. The Colonel walked away and Elvis said, if you call him, I'll kill you. <laughs> <laughs> because Elvis just didn't want Parker to know about his personal life and what he was doing. Yeah, well, he didn't need to. No. Yeah. And so... To this day, I kind of have an inkling that Parker was behind Joe coming back. Mm -hmm. But that's okay. I have, I have no, absolutely no problem with that. Then as time went on, uh, we did a couple of movies in, in 65. Uh, we did Paradise Hawaiian Style, even though it wasn't a great movie and a lot of some people don't like it. We had a great time in Hawaii. I had a confrontation with Colonel Parker um, over there, which uh, just shows you what Parker, the way Parker was, because Parker was basically nothing but a con man. Uh, I used to have send shivers up my spine every time he called Elvis' son, mm. because uh, you know, the only thing Parker cared about was Parker and money, and we were out on location in Hawaii at a place called Honame Bay. It's, right, it's, a, it's a beach. It's right on the water. And every week, uh, three, three or four weeks we were there, what I would do is because the guys were on a per diem to, you know, to eat. And I, I uh, used to give them money every Monday I'd go back to the hotel and get a big check cashed and come back and divvy out the money and give everybody their money so that they could have money to eat on all week long. And uh, the colonel was there that day, and I had a big wad of cash, naturally. And he saw me giving the, some of the guys money. So he came over, and in a loud voice he said, let me have $300. And I looked at him, I said, uh, Colonel, uh, I can't. He said, what do you mean you can't? I said, this is money for the guys to eat on. This is not my money. And uh, I have to give it to the guys to eat. And he said, whose money is that? And I said, like I told you, he said, yeah, but, but who's providing the money? I said, Elvis is. He said, are you telling me? And now his voice is getting louder. Because what he was trying to do was make a fool out of me in front of the cast and the crew. Mm -hmm. And he said, are you telling me I can't have $300 of Elvis's money? I said, Colonel, and by now I was starting to get pissed. I said, Colonel, like I said, this money has to be given to the guys so that they can eat on. You want to take food out of their mouths? And he said, that's Mr. Presley's money, and you're telling me I can't. And by now, he's shouting. And I said, that's right, Colonel. If it was my money, I might give it to you. And I used the word might. Mm -hmm. I said, but it's not mine to give to you. So he raises his cane up in the air. And oh, boy. Shouts. And he shouts at me. He says, don't you ever come ask me for anything, ever. I looked at him in the face, and I said, Colonel, I never have, and I never will. And I said, if you, if, if Elvis comes over here and tells me to give you $300, I'll give you $300. I said, other than that, I'm not going to do it. I can't. And Colonel, and Elvis came over and he said, what the hell's going on? And I told him. He said, give him the $300. So I counted out $300 and I threw it in the sand. I said, there's your money, Colonel. And I walked away. Hmm. I walked up the beach. Because I was, by that time, I was just burning mad. But I wasn't going to let him make a fool of me. And Elvis come running after me, and he puts his arm around me, and he said, you know what that old fool just said to me? I said, what? He said, keep him. He's uh, looking out for you. Hmm. I said, Elvis, that's just his way of covering up. 
because he knows he made a fool of himself. And I didn't play along. Mm -hmm. But those are the little games that Parker used to play. That's another reason why I didn't like them. Anyhow, uh, in uh, 66, we had just come back from making a movie. I forgot what movie it was. In late November or early December, I can't remember. And at that time, before then, uh, the waterfall that's in what is known as the Jungle Room mm -hmm. that was built by somebody else was not working. It was, a, it was a shoddy job that had been done to begin with. And Elvis said, I need somebody to come fix this. I want him to fix it, somebody who knows what he's doing. Well, my brother-in-law was uh, an interior designer, and he did stuff like that. He built things like that. Uh, he and my sister were in that business. My sister was a decorator. And I said, well, Elvis, I said, I can get my brother-in-law to come out here and do it and look at it. He said, yeah, do that. So my brother-in-law came out, and I introduced him to Elvis, and Elvis told him, you know, what the problem was and what he wanted done. And my brother-in-law said, no problem. He said, uh, about one thing, I'll do it on one condition. He said, what's that? He said, that you don't see it until I'm finished. And Elvis looked at him. He said, okay, Michelangelo. I, you know, he was remembering that movie with mm -hmm. Michelangelo and the Pope. And the Pope would walk in while he was doing the Sistine Chapel ceiling. And he'd say, when will it be ready? You know, he said, when can I see it? And Michelangelo would say, when it's finished. And that, they had a running thing like that. Mm -hmm. so Elvis kind of liked that. And he dubbed my brother Michelangelo, my brother-in-law. And my brother-in-law did the wall and he fixed it, you know, real good where it worked. And uh, he added a little statue of uh, up on the wall of Moses and the Ten Commandments, which, which Elvis liked. And uh, about a month or so later, he said, uh, after Larry Geller had gotten Elvis hooked on his... Uh, what I call California cult, mm -hmm. uh, the Far Eastern religion, and took him to the the uh, realization park, self-realization park, out near the ocean, which which was a, is a beautiful, serene place if you want to go be by yourself and think, you know, and meditate if you wanted to. And Elvis came home and he he said. I'd like for you to get your brother-in-law to come out here. I want to talk to him. I said, what are you going to do now? He said, I'd like for him to, where the bird bath is, on the side of Graceland, where the meditation garden is now, was nothing but an old, broken-down bird bath and uh, shrubbery. I mean, it looked terrible. It looked like run-down. They had those pillars up there, but they were all cracked and they were about to decay. The wall where the stained glass windows was, that there was no wall back then mm -hmm. at that time. He said, I, I, I would really like to have a place, like a meditation garden that I could go to when I want to and just be by myself and think. I said, okay, so I brought my brother-in-law out. <coughs> Elvis told him what he was trying to achieve and he said, okay, he said, but the same deal goes. You don't see it until I'm finished. And he said, okay. Well, we had to go to California anyway uh, shortly after that. And so while we were gone, my brother-in-law and sister did designed and built some meditation garden the way it is today. Mm -hmm. And uh, we came home that night after that movie, and uh, my brother-in-law said, well, it's ready if you want to go look at it. He said, you know, I really would like to look at it by myself. And it was at nighttime, so everything was lit up. The uh, fountain that my brother-in-law built uh, was all lit up in colored lights. He had those torch pots that were lit up. And uh, he had 14 different sprays that, that were matched to the colors. 
and of course the, the rest of the garden looked like it does now which my brother-in-law had gotten those stained glass windows from Italy as well as those statues of those short soldiers back then and the bricks came from Mexico and Elvis went out there and he stayed for about 30 minutes and he came back in he had tears in his eyes and uh, he just said you know he just thought it was so beautiful and it touched him so much you know he couldn't quit thanking my sister and brother on anyhow he did that and then Elvis decided he wanted his bedroom redone <laughs> and it was the same deal it was while we were away well we came back after doing another movie in November late November early December of 66 <clears throat> and that night we got home and they had a little ceremony upstairs my brother-in-law placed Elvis in front of the closed doors uh, of the bedroom and uh all of us were up there, and my brother-in-law then opened up its, its double doors, and uh, he opened up the double doors, and Elvis saw what my brother-in-law did, and once again, tears came to his eyes. He said, man, this is just beyond my belief. So my brother-in-law knew that Elvis's, Elvis's taste was flashy, mm. but my brother-in-law did flash with class, and... Uh, Elvis was just overjoyed and happy and and everything else. And by that time, I, I had built my own house in about five minutes from Graceland. And, and uh, so I, I said to Elvis, I said, well, I'm going home. And everybody else went home. And when I left, Elvis was just overjoyed. And so the next day, uh, no, I, 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 this was before I moved into my house. This was, uh, I was still, we were still living in an apartment away from Graceland. And Joe lived in there in that apartment complex, as did uh, Larry Geller. And that afternoon I came up to the house, figuring Elvis was, you know, going to be all happy because of the way he was the night before when I walked in the back door Billy Smith and Mike Keaton who was working for Elvis at the time were sitting in the den and they said hey Marty and Elvis must have heard him because he and his father came out from the kitchen and Elvis just shocked me he started screaming at me and yelling at me and <laughs> calling my family all kinds of names and calling my brother-in-law and sister names yada 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 and I, I was just I was stunned and I, I figured right off the bat that his father was behind it all because his father didn't like the fact that he had no say-so about anything my brother-in-law or sister did. That was between them and Elvis, and I was more like a middleman. If they had to ask Elvis something and we weren't there, they'd call me and I'd ask Elvis and I'd call them back. Yes, sir, hang on for one second. 